Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the 2012 World Town Planning Day celebration. Our event tonight is titled Win or Waste, Atlanta at Odds Over Stadium Proposal. My name is Rochelle Gossman. I am Vice President of the Student Planning Association and one of the organizers of tonight's event. The objective of World Town Planning Day is a, as a global event is to celebrate the field of planning and to make other, others aware of what planners do. When choosing a format for tonight's event, we could not think of a better way to celebrate planning than to see it in action in the form of community gathering and discussion. As a result, the planning committee decided to attempt to create a forum for the Atlanta community to discuss one of the most pressing local development projects, the proposal for a new football stadium in the downtown area. We hope to explore the implications of a new stadium on the downtown area and surrounding communities, but also on the broader planning goals of quality, economic, and community development. Before we begin, I would like to express my gratitude to all the people and groups that helped make tonight a success. First, I would like to thank our guest speakers, um, who, will in, who will, we will introduce more properly in a moment, <laughs> and um, for our presenters um, earlier this evening, uh, Lauren Cardoni and Mackenzie Madden. I'd also like to thank, thank the College of Architecture and the School of City and Regional Planning for their, especially for their IT and facilities support. I would like to thank Dr. Bruce, Bruce Stiftel, Dr. Brian Stone, Melinda Williams, and Tracy Blackwell for their guidance, and Dr. Larry Keating, Moki Macias, and Nathaniel Smith for their support and insight. Finally, I would like to thank the Student Planning Association and the World Town Planning Day Planning Committee for their creativity, initiative, and unwavering energy. And finally, tonight's volunteers for pulling all of this together. Thank you so much. Again, I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I hope that you enjoy the program. Now I ask you to please help me in welcome, welcoming the chair of the School of the City Regional Planning, Dr. Bruce Stiftel. Thank you, Rochelle. Um, so good to see all of you here tonight. The School of, Reg of City and Regional Planning works to advance sustainable, resilient, and just communities in Georgia and throughout the world. And uh, our World Town Planning Day celebration has been going on for quite some years. Uh, th this tradition began in 1949 and has been celebrated in November annually by many planners and planning associations around the world. Uh, this week there will be celebrations in, that I know of in Toronto, in Brussels, um, in, um, uh, in Rioja, Spain, in Honolulu, in Madeira, Ohio, Kingston, Jamaica, uh, as well as other places. There will also be a webinar that will begin tomorrow uh, and run through Wednesday that's being hosted by 30 uh, planners organizations in different countries around the world, including the American Planning Association, on the theme of Smart Communities Connect. And uh, if you visit the APA website, you can find a portal that will get you into that webinar. Here in Atlanta, our World Town Planning Day celebration is organized, as you know, by the Student Planning Association. And uh, I want to recognize the students who've been involved in trying to bring this together tonight. They include Johnny Aguilar, Meredith Britt, Darren Cooper, Aaron Goose, Rochelle Gausman, Sarah McCauley, Gillian Campbell, Kate Moreno, Landon Reed, Audrey Spiegel, Pat Terranova, and Travis Voyle. Uh, these SPA members chose to organize this year's World Town Planning Day celebration around a discussion of the stadium proposal for Atlanta. Sports stadia have been focal points for urban development and civic pride, uh, going back perhaps to the Roman Colosseum. But never before the late 20th century have they cost as much as they're costing today. We're talking at price tags in excess of $1 billion for some of these stadia. Proponents describe these facilities as investments in our future, uh, as tools that will bring economic development to our communities, and as iconic images that will serve as focal points for civic pride. At the same time, these stadia come at a time when urban infrastructure is decaying, schools are failing, and taxpayers are in revolt, and so their price tags are not easy to swallow. And the sea of parking that often surrounds these stadia creates gaping holes in our urban fabric which challenge walkability. So 
these are difficult decisions. There are strong potential upsides and serious potential downsides. I hope that tonight's discussions will be helpful to all of us here in understanding these proposals, but especially to the city of Atlanta and this region in making decisions about these, this proposal. Again, thank you for being here. Now I'll welcome our moderator, moderator for tonight's event, uh, Patrick Terranova. Thank you, Rochelle, and thank you, Bruce. Uh, my name is Patrick Terranova, and I'm the president of the Student Planning Association. And uh, I want to just, again, thank you for your attendance tonight. And before we get started, I know we're anxious to get in, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items. The way tonight will work is throughout the evening, we'll have a few poll questions for you, the audience, to answer. So you will have a few questions, and you can text in your responses, and we'll show them in live time. Uh, and also, I'll introduce the speakers one by one. They'll speak for 10 minutes apiece, and then we'll move on to our panel discussion where you can ask them questions. Uh, so just to explain real quickly how the poll will work, uh, this is how you can text in your responses. Uh, the, the code in, uh, highlighted in green is what you will text to. And then you'll have a series of responses to a given question that will correlate to a number that you'll text in. Uh, and this is just an example of how that would work. So you text it, the, the code, which is an orange, uh, that correlates with the response uh, to the number, uh, which is highlighted in green. Uh, and just as a information, uh, standard texting rates apply. We do not have access to your phone number. And also, <laughs> capitalization does not matter, but spelling and spaces do. So uh, that's how the polls will work tonight. Uh, I hope you can participate. Uh, so to get started, we'll just have a, a quick test, an example, if you can get your phones ready. Uh, the first question is, what do you think is the most important function of a city and regional planning professional if assisting in the development of a new stadium? Helping mitigate impacts to surrounding communities, which is code 547249. Providing information on potential economic impacts, which is code 547250. Developing a recommendation for best location, which is code 551268, or all of the above. And here we go. And there we have it. That was pretty quick. Uh, so I think you guys have the gist of it. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. We were getting some more responses in. That was just the first response. Yeah. We'll give it a, a, a couple seconds to, to update. Cool. Nobody wants the location. I think I have a lot of fun with that. All right, I think we have the gist of how people are answering, uh, so I think we can move on. Uh, so I guess uh, we're all of the above kind of people. So now for the first real question of the night, uh, and then we'll move on to our speakers. What is your opinion on, the Atla on Atlanta building a new football stadium? I do not support building a new stadium, code 551271. I support building it and providing public funding, code 555099. I support building it, but only with private funding, code 555130, or undecided, 555131. And we'll give it a couple seconds to allow everyone to get their responses in. Ooh, it's coming back. Interesting. Um, got some undecideds in the room. Okay, I think that's pretty close. Everyone, everyone's responded, right? Uh, so, just make a mental note of your responses, because we may or may not get back to this question at the end of the show. The show? The show? Oh. Uh, so now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, speaking first tonight is Mike Dudgeon, who currently serves as the state rep representative for District 24 in Forsyth County. He serves on the Education, Energy, Utilities, and Telecommunications, and the Science and Technology Committees. Prior to taking office in 2011, 
He served on the Forsyth County Board of Education and has spent his career in the technology industry. He helped establish the Alpharetta-based startup Radiant Systems in the 1990s, and in 2001, he founded Tier One, a leading engineering consulting firm in Forsyth County. Representative Dudgeon has also helped found Qualia Labs, which conducts uh, research on new computer architectures and artificial intelligence. Uh, Representative Dudgeon has a passion for youth and public service. He has been an active member in his community, and he has served as a leader for the Boy Scouts. Representative Dudgeon has a bachelor's and master's degree from ele in electrical engineering right here from Georgia Tech, and he hails from Johns Creek. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Representative Mike Dudgeon. All right, thanks, Pat. Microphone working? Oh, you want to come up? Okay, cool. All right. Okay. Well, Pat, I appreciate the opportunity to come back. I told him I, I have a pretty busy schedule, but when Georgia Tech calls, it goes to the top of the list. Like I said, I'm a graduate here from the 80s, uh, double E. I love Georgia Tech. It's still the best school in the country, in my opinion. Anything I can do to come back and help here is great. I've got a senior in high school who's wavering between UGA and Tech, and I'm trying to push him really hard to Tech, so y'all y'all pray for me. Um, <laughs> so about the stadiums, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about where I'm coming from, but, you know, stadiums, uh, as we'll, more of the panels will get more detail, I'm sure, a lot of them are what are called public-private partnerships, and philosophically, I don't have an objection with that. In fact, I think especially for road building that I think public-private partnerships are important projects. I think the I-75 corridor expansion they're looking at with the state, I think, is a great example of that. So philosophically, I don't have a, a fundamental problem with public-private partnerships, so I kind of wanted to get that out of the, of the gate. But my job as state legislator and the whole state legislature the past four or five years has not been particularly fun. Representative Taylor has been in the legislature longer than I have. I've only been for two years. A part of what we're doing is a very tough budget environment, so we're having to say no to a lot of people. Um, the state budget is roughly $19 billion this year. Um, it bottomed out at 17. It was as high as 21 a few years ago before the recession hit. That's a limited amount of money. And Georgia is a balanced budget state by constitution, so we don't get to borrow money to spend more than we take in, so every year we have to make some hard decisions. A year and a half ago, I had a whole bunch of uh, college students, I don't know if y'all were there, outside the Capitol for several days when we were discussing the Hope Scholarship. And, and funding restrictions about that. Um, K-12 education, there's a lot of districts around the state that are not operating 180 days, um, lots of teacher furloughs, a lot of stress in the, in the education system right now that's going on. So you have to consider this as a backdrop of, the, in my mind, where this decision is coming from. What is the current financial situation in the state? The state is healthy financially in the fact that we are one of seven states with the AAA bond rating. So we have kept our financial house in order. The balanced budget really helps. But the bottom line is there's not a lot of money to sitting around to go to, uh, to extra projects. Um, so we have to make those difficult decisions. And it's, again, it's very tough as a legislator to be the one to have to tell a teacher or have to tell a state trooper, no, you're not going to have a raise for the sixth or seventh year in a row. And, you know, the alternative to this state budget environment would be to raise taxes. And I don't want to get into that today, but I will tell you that my constituents in particular would be electing a new representative if I push for a large tax increase. And in general, and it's different by different parts of the state, but if you add up the general mood of the voter around the state based on my colleagues in the legislature, I'm not really in the mood to raise taxes. Um, so that's the environment we're in. So what's going on with the dome? Um, a couple years ago, and this is before I was in the legislature, but uh, Representative Taylor was there. The Georgia legislature authorized an extension of the hotel motel tax for the city of Atlanta for up to $300 million for the next 30 years. And if the Atlanta City Council so voted, they could apply 30 something percent, I think 39 percent of that tax could go towards a new stadium project. So this was again approved by the legislature back in 2010 before I was there. Um, so that money is sort of sitting on the table and that is being discussed right now with the World Congress Center Authority and with the, with the Falcons about this stadium deal. So they kind of have that money on the table. Um, they are looking perhaps to increase bonding authority and maybe some other public money, and that's where they may be having to come back to the legislature next year, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But so what's going on with the dome? As most of you know, the dome was built in the early 90s, and, and I know all of you know it's not fully paid for yet. The bonds on the dome don't fully expire until 2016. Though if there was a stadium project, refinancing all that obviously would be part of the deal. But um, the dome actually is still not paid for, which I think is interesting. And one way I look at it too is, you know, making a decision about a stadium is what do we have and what do we not have. 
The Georgia Dome is able to attract every top-end sporting event except for one now. Commissioner Goodell has made it pretty clear he's not going to bring the Super Bowl back here with the Georgia Dome. But it does attract SEC championship game, the NCAA Final Four basketball tournament will be back here next March. Um, we'll probably be in the, in the running for one of the new uh, college football playoff games on the College Football Hall of Fame across the street, uh, Peach Bowl. We bring in premier sporting events here. It's not like we're sitting around not having a lot of premier events here, but it doesn't bring in the Super Bowl. And the NFL very badly wants to bring the Super Bowl here, and that's part of the reason why they're looking at this, at this particular project. Um, but I look at it again from a priority point of view. When you're doing budgeting, just like you're, you're, you're doing your household budget or your personal budget, you look at what I have to have and what I want to have and what would be really nice to have. In the current environment, in my opinion, that right now a new stadium to replace the Georgia Dome, which already works pretty darn well, is a nice to have. And fundamentally, at this time in, in, the, in the life of the state, we don't have money for the nice to have type of things. And that's kind of the, the, the genesis of where I'm coming from. Um, I'm sure some of these panelists here are much more have expertise on all the economic ramifications. I know there are studies that will tell you that it does pay you back to build the stadium, some that say it won't. I've got a good study that I think says it won't pay you back. I have no idea what the other panelists are going to say, so I'm actually very curious to hear some of the data because I'm an engineer, so I'm a data guy. I'd like to hear it. But, you know, part of what's going on here, um, you know, how, let me go skip to my uh, one thing and then come back to, to what I think is going on fundamentally. Um, I got involved in this last February when the legislature was in session and the budget included $10 million for land to expand the World Congress Center footprint um, downtown. And some of us legislators were like, is this going to be for a stadium? And they said, well, probably, maybe not, but not really sure. And that's kind of what got us going, saying, well, do we want to put $10 million in the budget to be given or gifted to the Falcons? And so we developed a resolution, which is a non-binding um, statement for the legislature. And I had 28 co-sponsors who said that we wanted to make sure that if they did a stadium, it was done basically with free market money and not with public money. Um, and that's kind of how I got into this. And then now I've become sort of, I don't know exactly how it happened, but I've become one of the people who seems to be asked to talk a lot on this issue. I don't mind doing it, but um, it wasn't something that I was seeking out to become the anti-Falcons guy. I'm a huge football fan. I was born and raised in Tuscaloosa, Alabama with Bear Bryant on the wall. Went Georgia Tech, a huge Georgia Tech football fan. I've season tickets, been going here ever since I graduated. Um, I, I go to Falcons game, but I love, I love football, so I have nothing against that. And, and I pass no judgment of you planners about how the stadium should be, whether it's good or bad for the community. I'm going to let you all figure that out. I'm looking at it with my hat as a legislator and as a taxpayer. And here, here's how I sum it up. We have a problem right now in this country. It's a very bad problem, in my opinion, which is that the voters do not trust their government. There's a lot of reasons why the voters should not trust their government, because the government has done a lot, of, a lot of crazy things, a lot of things that don't deserve trust. If you look at it, the voters trust the federal government about this much, and they trust the state maybe this much, and they trust their local guys about that much. And I feel, as, as a relatively new legislator, that I want to do everything I can to restore that trust. And I think we saw some of the lack of trust in the recent TSPLOS vote. I mean, there was controversial issues about whether the project list was good or bad, but I think it failed as hard as it did. Um, and my county was not in the Atlanta region, it was in the mountain regions, and the transport, there was no controversy about whether MARTA was good or bad or any of that. It was strictly about roads, and it failed three to one, one because of anti-tax, but two because our, my constituents say, ah, you know, that list looks pretty good, but I don't believe you. The Georgia DOT, they're going to change it around. Um, you're not, you're going to, you legislator guys, you're just going to bait and switch us and do a bunch of other stuff. And there's a lack of trust built up there. And so in that environment of lack of trust, and we've just come to the voters and said, we don't have enough money for roads, we want extra penny for sales tax. We don't have enough money for schools, so we're going to cut back the number of days teachers. We don't have enough money for the Hope Scholarship, so we're going to cut it back from 100%. Uh, we don't have enough money for raises for any state employees. And all these things we can't, 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 can't have. And then I'm a voter and I say, oh, but by the way, we have money to build a stadium to replace a perfectly good stadium that's right there. To me, that doesn't pass a smell test. And, I, and I, in, in talking about this, I have a lot of positive feedback for what I would call the average voter. Interesting enough, it hasn't been particularly partisan. I'm a Republican. I come from a Republican suburban part of Atlanta. But I've had a lot of feedback from both sides of the aisle on this. Um, so I don't necessarily know whether it breaks down completely on partisan, partisan values. So I'm looking at it from a very big picture. 
I'm not schooled in the gory details of studies. Um, I'd be interested to hear what the panelists say, but I'm just looking at it. My hat as a legislator is somebody who has to be the guy who makes that hard call of what we can and cannot afford, and, and that's my perspective. A detailed point before I, before I close is that um, another reason that people don't trust the government is because they change their minds all the time. And I've told people this publicly, the legislature already promised the $300 million of the hotel motel tax. I'm not interested and I don't think anybody really that I'm working with is interested in revoking that or going back on that commitment. That commitment was made by the legislature, it's on the table. And you know, we can debate whether that's a good idea, I probably would have voted against it had I been in the legislature at the time. But it's already there, we respect that. But my position is that um, there should be no new state money and no new state-backed bonds where the state taxpayer is actually the one who's, who's backing up the bonds. Um, that's my position. You know, the 300 is already on the table, and that better needs to be good enough. Anyway, again, I appreciate the opportunity to come here today, and go Jackets. I'm going to leave my glasses up there. Okay. Thank you, Representative Dudgeon. Uh, next we have Rashad Taylor. Uh, Rashad Taylor is the youngest member of the Georgia General Assembly and has been serving the 55th District in Fulton County since 2009. He serves on the Education, MARTA Oversight, and Ways and Means Committee and serves as the Deputy Whip for the House Democratic Caucus. In 2007, Representative Taylor was named one of 10 rising stars in national politics by Campaigns and Elections Magazine and has served as political director of the Democratic Party of Georgia. In addition to his work in public service, Representative Taylor is also an active member of his community. He is the founding member and has served on the executive committee for Atlanta Jobs with Justice and has also sat on the board of the Youth Task Force. Representative Taylor is originally from Washington, D.C. and attended Morehouse College. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Representative Anthony, I'm uh, sorry, Representative, <laughs> <laughs> Representative Rashad. Rashad Taylor. <laughs> Is this on? Can you hear me? Awesome. Uh, well, thanks so much. Um, I'm happy to be here. I live uh, not far from here. I live in the historic West End neighborhood. I represent some small portions of Georgia Tech currently in the legislature. My district uh, is only in the city of Atlanta, and it goes from Buckhead to Fort McPherson. And so I represent some of the wealthiest and poorest uh, folks in our city. And uh, in 2010, let's see, let me get a... I did do a little, this will help me stay on track. Uh, so in 2010, the legislature, uh, Mark Burkhalter, who used to be the Speaker Pro Tem, rose to become the Speaker temporarily from North Fulton, um, North Fulton County, sponsored House Bill 903 that extended the hotel motel tax um, in Georgia. Uh, and it extends it to 2050. And we use the hotel motel tax in Georgia for several things. It funds our Atlanta Convention and Visitors Bureau, a portion of it, some portion of it goes to the city of Atlanta. Some portion of it, about 39% or so, 33%, uh, goes to pay the debt service on the Georgia Dome that we built um, in 1989. That motel tax was set to expire in a few years, like Representative Dudgeon said, and so the legislature extended the 7% hotel motel tax in Atlanta to fund either renovations to an existing multi-purpose dome facility or for a new facility. And I actively helped actually save this bill from dying a death on the floor of the house in 2010 uh, for two, two reasons uh, that were in the bill. One of them is it said that a new facility must be located in Atlanta on the Georgia World Congress Center Authority property. And for me, I'm an Atlanta guy, I want to keep the Falcons in Atlanta. This is around the time, you know, we heard LA's looking for a team. LA's the number one media market in the country. They're still looking for a team. You've got, you know, uh, talk of wanting to move the Falcons outside of the city of Atlanta. I'm actually from Washington, D.C. 
And a quick story, a few years um, ago, the Washington Redskins moved their facility outside of the District of Columbia to the state of Maryland for one reason, because they couldn't come to an agreement with the mayor on building a new facility. And the RFK Stadium at that time, I think was 25 or 30 years old. It was crumbling uh, at that time. And so the owner of the Redskins moved the team facility outside the city of Washington, D.C. And it has really hurt the city. And so now there actually talks about moving the team back into the city of Washington, D.C. So I come uh, at this with an experience of having an NFL team actually leave the host city for another location simply because you can't come to an agreement with the local um, elected officials on how to build and finance a new stadium. The other reason that I supported 903 actively was that it said that before uh, we get this indebtedness to the state, that the World Congress Center Authority must have a signed agreement with an NFL franchise for the duration of the debt service, meaning as long as we're going to have to pay a bill on this dome, the World Congress Center must have a contract, an agreement with an NFL franchise that they will lease space in this facility for as long as we owe the payments on this facility. For me, those two um, points were very important to pass in this bill. The speaker, uh, one of the folks who introduced us, talked about urban development and civic pride when it comes to stadiums. But there's a third reason that we need to be um, on the front end of this, and that is competitiveness. You know, we have cities like Charlotte and other cities around the South that are really trying to be the new leaders of the South. They're trying to become the new Atlanta. And so every time we try to get a, attract a new, um, a new, uh, what do you call it? A new convention, a new, um, a new site for, for, for the NASCAR um, museum, for an example, we're competing with other cities. So we have to stay competitive as a city, as the leader in the South. And so I actively supported um, this legislation. Joe Frank Harris used to be the governor of Georgia in 1989. He actively supported using public money to build a Georgia dome. And he said the Georgia dome is a wise business investment. Uh, for the state in the same way as the Georgia ports of Savannah and Brunswick are. You currently have the governor of Georgia, the mayor of Atlanta, uh, the president of the United States. Everyone is concerned about deepening the port of Savannah because they understand the economic impact that the port of Savannah has not just on the Savannah region but on the state of Georgia as a whole. Cargo that comes into uh, the port of Savannah travels all across uh, our highways in Georgia and so it has an economic impact beyond just its regional impact. And I think we have the same thing with the Georgia Dome. And I think Joe Frank Harris uh, laid that out in a great op-ed he wrote back in 1989, February 16, 1989, actually. And one thing we know is that the Georgia Dome has about a $300 million annual economic impact on our region. And that's not insignificant. $300 million economic impact by one facility owned by the World Congress Center, I think is a significant uh, economic investment in this region, particularly at a time where our economy is struggling. Uh, and so how, how do we, why is Atlanta the city that it is? I mean, we got the 1996 um, Olympics, we got the Chick-fil-A Bowl, we got Super Bowls, we got WrestleMania, next year we're getting the Final Four, we also got another Super Bowl in 2000. It is because of what we have built on the World Congress Center um, property. The Georgia Dome used to be the world's largest domed facility. Uh, we were ahead of the game when, when we talk about entertaining people in our city. The World Congress Center is one of the largest um, civic centers uh, in the country. Uh, and we're able to attract a lot of these conventions, a lot of these organizations, a lot of these sports venues because of what we have built in the World Congress Center area. Not just the World Congress Center itself, you've got the Georgia Dome, you've got Phillips Arena, you've got Centennial Olympic Park, uh, and now you're gonna have the multimodal Gulch uh, area going in near um, the Castleberry Hill neighborhood. What we have built there and MARTA intersecting uh, in two or three different ways coming into that area, I think is very important for our city. We live off of a sales tax in this city. When sales taxes dip, when people don't come into our city and buy and shop and invest, we lose money. We're not able to do some of the things that Representative Dudgeon talks about us being able to do. A lot of people who talk about this always compare it to the T-Splast. And I 
actively actually opposed the T-SPLOST. Um, we remember it on July 31st, we remember these colorful billboards, right? The TV ads and the woman with the seat belt. The difference in the Hotel Moto tax and the T-SPLOST, I think there are two important points to make. One, we're extending an existing tax. This isn't a new tax. It's not a tax increase. It's not a new tax. And unlike the T-SPLOST, it's not an across the board regressive sales tax. Meaning when you go to the grocery store, you're not gonna pay more for groceries. When seniors go to CVS, they're not gonna pay more for their prescription drugs by extending the hotel motel tax. Uh, and so I think the one thing we've gotta be clear on is it's not a new tax. It's a tax that exists that we're simply extending the life of this tax to 2050. The other th reason that I support using the hotel motel tax to fund uh, partially uh, a new stadium is because it's a tax that's largely borne by people who visit our city. If you live in our city and you happen to be able to have to stay in a hotel four or five nights, six nights a week, then you're going to pay a 7% hotel motel tax. But if you live in our city, and most like probably everyone in our city, you stay at home uh, at night, then you're not going to pay this tax. You will never see or be affected by this hotel motel tax. This is not a tax increase that you'll see when you go to the grocery store. This is not a tax increase you'll see when you go buy a car. This is not a tax increase you'll see when you go shopping for school clothes. This is something that is borne by people who visit our city, right? They visit our city to do what? Visit the World Congress Center, to visit the Georgia Dome, to visit Phillips Arena, to visit Centennial Olympic Park. And for me, it only makes economic sense that to have the people who are visiting our city pay for the resources that they come to actually um, visit. There were five cities, six franchises, but five cities over the last 30 years that lost NFL franchise teams. Los Angeles, twice. <laughs> the Rams and the Raiders, I believe. Baltimore, originally lost a franchise. St. Louis, originally lost a franchise. Cleveland, lost a franchise. Houston, lost a franchise. Of all of those five cities, six franchises that left their host cities, four of them, years later, were able to reattract an NFL franchise. And you're not a major city in this nation if you don't have an NFL franchise. You can't consider yourself a major leader if you don't have an NFL team, if you don't have an NBA team. No, no one's gonna wanna come and live in your city and stay in our city and play in our city if we don't have things that attract people um, to our city. And so I'll wrap up here with just with this. When we look at the four teams that lost an NFL franchise but then regained an NFL franchise, Houston regained a franchise, Anybody know whose mascot that is? Cleveland. Cleveland Browns, that's right. Cleveland Browns, the Baltimore, Baltimore Ravens, and the St. Louis Rams. The Houston Texans, the Cleveland Browns, Baltimore Ravens, and the St. Louis Rams. Each of those cities lost a franchise, they regained their franchise, but guess what? At a greater cost. The reason, and, here, and here's what's so important. Uh, I think that I, I'm gonna sit down after I say this. The reason those cities lost their franchise was the same reason the Redskins left D.C. It's because they couldn't come to an agreement with the local elected officials on building a new facility for their team. And so when they wanted to reattract the team, the Houston Texans ended up, the city of Houston ended up paying 73% of the financing for a stadium to reattract an NFL team. Cleveland, 76.5% of the total cost of construction was borne by the taxpayers in Cleveland. Baltimore, it was 87%. In the St. Louis, it was 100%. This isn't 10 years ago, it's not 15 years ago, it's not 20 years ago, this is within the last few years. Uh, to me, we've got a balanced investment here in Atlanta. When we built this dome in 1989, it was all public dollars. Arthur Blank didn't have to put one dime of skin in the game on this existing dome. But what we have now is a, is a plan that really calls for about 33% of public investment and about, oh, yeah. I must have clicked there, and about 67% uh, of private 
investment. Unlike some of these other cities that they're paying more than 70, 80, St. Louis, it's 100% of the construction cost. In Atlanta, we've got a balanced approach. We're asking the public, visitors to our city, to come up with 33% of a new dome, and we're asking Arthur Blank to come up with 67%. To me, that's a much balanced approach than we had in 1989. It's an approach that I can support particularly as long as it comes with community investments on behalf of the Atlanta Falcons. You've got to have a public investment in the facility and the infrastructure, sidewalks, all that. You've got to have the private money to come up with the rest, but you've also got to have the Falcons and the World Congress Center step up and continue to play an active role in the community. I hope Reverend Motley will talk more about that. I want to talk about it from a public policy standpoint, but I think in terms of a balanced approach, you've also got to have some community investment on behalf of the Falcons. I think they're committed to that, and as the talks go forward, I hope more details will come out about that. But I look forward to your questions this evening. Thank you, Representative Taylor. Next, we have Reverend Anthony Motley, who received his bachelor's degree in 1980 from Morehouse College, majoring in religion and minoring in philosophy. He also has earned a Master's of Arts in Christian Education from the Interdenominational Theological Center. Reverend, Reverend Motley accepted the pastorship of Lindsay Street Baptist Church on September 7th, 1980. Reverend Motley is deeply involved in community activities, seeking to improve the conditions of the socially and economically disadvantaged. And he is active in uh, several organizations, which include the Concerned Black Clergy, the New Era State Convention of Georgia, the Progressive Baptist Convention, the American Baptist Convention, the Atlanta Baptist Minister Union, the Vine City Housing Ministry, and the English Avenue Community Development Corporation. He has also served as an adjunct professor at Morris Brown College, and he hails from Tuskegee, Alabama. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Reverend Anthony Motley. that I was last so I'd have more time. You know. <laughs> but uh, I um, am the pastor of the Lindsay Street Baptist Church and have been serving there for some 32 years. And normally I, I go around uh, we acknowledge my distinguished panelists and uh, the wonderful people, many of you in the audience who I work with in community service. Normally, I just go around talking about <coughs> loving your neighbor. That's what I'm accustomed to doing. Uh, I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm comfortable talking about what Jesus said. He instructed us to, first of all, love him with all of our hearts and minds, souls, and strength. And then he instructed us to do something that in too many instances is tremendously lost on much of the discourse uh, as it relates to much of the sermonizing that we hear. <coughs> and that is 
our love for each other. A lawyer, an attorney, asked him a question, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered him by saying, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. And that's a general statement that covers everyone. It's both individual and collective. It's love your Latino neighbor, your African American neighbor, your gay neighbor, your straight neighbor, your Baptist, Methodist, Episcopal, Holy Roller, sanctified neighbor. Love all of your neighbors as you love yourself. Now that's a tall order. And it's both, it applies to both the individual and institutions alike. It's personal love and it's corporate love. And so in the midst of this issue, this very critical issue of the coming, we believe the imminent coming of this new stadium, We've seen this before. We've seen it in the Dome Stadium. And the English Avenue community of which I, the Lindsay Street Church, is a part of and, we've, and we serve is a very challenged community. Um, perhaps, maybe now, nothing more than perhaps three to 4,000 residents having decreased from upwards of 12,000 back in the um, 1960s and 70s due to a great many causes that we don't have time to go into this evening. But for the, uh, because of the neglect, because of the indifference towards the English Avenue community, you would know the community because it's west of you, it's southwest of Georgia Tech. We're your neighbors. And we love you and we hope you love us. We love the government and we want the government to love us. And for those of you perhaps who haven't ventured in that direction. It is the community where a lady by the name of Katherine Johnston, 92 year old lady was, her life was taken by the Atlanta Police Department. Good police department, they do good work. We love them, they're part of our community. We need them. But it was a terrible, terrible tragedy and a terrible mistake that cost the life of our grandmother, one of our grandmothers, as she sat in her room. Some false tipster, because our community is so infested with drugs, that upon some tip, they, instead of knocking on the door like they would do perhaps in another community, they simply busted the door down and went in firing and she, her life was taken in a hail of gunfire. So we are a challenged community. And actually, as it relates to the stadium, we don't have the luxury. I'm, you know, we, I don't think it's the right climate, the right time, all of the good arguments that have been put forth to us by my good friend Rashad, notwithstanding, uh, for the city to be a first-rate and first-class city, we all want that. Um, but at the same time, even with those things that uh, oppose the coming of the stadium, as my good friend argued, we don't have the luxury to oppose it that vehemently because for our community 
we just need, we just want to catch a ride on the first train that's producing some resources that can be shared with our community. We're in that desperate of a situation in the English Avenue community. And so what we are proposing with the coalition of pastors and community activists and others, because of the impact and because of the fact that the English Avenue community and the Vine City communities together are the communities of greatest impact. The greatest impact that the stadium will have will be on us, whether it's in the Gulch, whether it's over or across from the Antioch Church, where Herndon Homes once existed. Either way, our communities will be impacted more than any, than any other. So we are proposing that because of the investment by the taxpayers whom we represent, notwithstanding what my good friend Richard said, as it relates to those who visit our city, being the largest contributors, although we eat in the restaurants, of the hotels, we work in the restaurants, we rent and lease room and space in the restaurants, local taxpayers. So we do have an investment as well. The bottom line is that $300 million of public money will be invested into the construction of this, this billion dollar stadium. <coughs> The question is, what is the return to the taxpayers on the profits, on the investment from the profits? What is, what are, what is the return to the citizenry for that $300 million plus investment and more specifically what is the return on the investment to the two communities of greatest impact what is that impact this is a study from the NPUL economic development committee impact I'll just read just a little uh, because it's a very lengthy uh, impact study the, one minute, one minute. NPUL, Economic Development, impact of the proposed open air stadium, loss of business opportunities, all businesses inside the stadium, impact on churches, noise, in Greece, and air Greece. What does that mean? <laughs> e Greece. Keep on coming in and out. Traffic coming in and out. Thank you. Potential to decrease availability of parking for church members, potential to distract youth from church attendance, loss of eco economy for the church, tithes and offerings. I'm seriously concerned about that. <laughs> <laughs> we feel it. I could go on and on. We feel it when there is a game on Sundays. Our churches suffer. Listen, we have members who are fans. We're not knocking. I'm a fan of the Falcons. We love the Falcons. <laughs> But the impact on our communities, our two communities, is unbelievable. And we suffer in attendance. We suffer in revenue. We, we suffer, listen, let me be frank with you. We suffer a few days before the games, the police descend upon English Avenue in Vine City and basically whoop the natives into um, cooperation. They let the community know in no uncertain terms that the good people are coming from other parts of the city. We want you to behave yourself. There are arrests 
in the community, there is intimidation in the community, on and on and on I could go. What we are proposing is a share, because of the impact on us, a share in the windfall profits. Windfall. Wonderful to have a top-notch city, but where, what, what is greatness if all of the revenues go up? That's what the election is going to be about tomorrow. If all of the, the revenues are going up to the 1%, nothing is coming down. We are proposing that our communities uh, share in the profits, profit sharing, and that a revenue stream is created. If we sit down at the table with the appropriate parties so that the communities of greatest impact will share in the profits of parking, advertisement, vendors, on and on down the line. We are your neighbors and we deserve to share in the bounty that God has created for all of his children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Motley. Uh, lastly, uh, we have Dr. Benjamin Flowers, who is a member of our very own uh, faculty here at the Georgia Institute of Technology Architecture College. Uh, here is a, he's been a faculty member since 2005, and his work examines architecture as a form of social activity intersected by politics, culture, and local economies. His work specializes in the ways that stadiums and other structures are constructed, the ends to which they are used, and the nature of public reaction to them. Dr. Flower's research has attracted nationwide recognition, and he was awarded the 2010 Outstanding Academic Title in Architecture by Choice Magazine. Among his recent publications is Stadium Architecture, Visual Iconogra I Iconography, and the Shaping of Urban and Sporting Identities, which was published in The Visual and Sport. Dr. Flowers received his PhD from the University of Minnesota and his BA from Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. He grew up in Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, Bulgaria, Romania, and Washington, DC. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Benjamin Flowers. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? I teach in this classroom every semester, and it's always nice to come here and see uh, excited faces. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Um, I, I come to this topic from the perspective of an architectural historian, uh, but I also come to it from the perspective of a fan of monumental urban structures, skyscrapers, and stadia. That said, I'm not um, uh, uncritical to the complex issues of power uh, and planning and geography that these kinds of structures raise. So what I want to do is briefly talk about a couple of, uh, of issues and then suggest a couple of ways in which this project, because I, I agree with Reverend Motley, I think that, you know, that it, it will happen. Uh, the growth coalition is, is, is entrenched uh, and the political establishment, I think, uh, wants to see this happen. I think it will happen. The question is, how does it happen? So first thing, uh, we tend to think of stadia or stadiums uh, as buildings that host sporting events. And perhaps this was at one time true. But since the late 1970s, stadiums are actually something else. They are machines for generating revenue. That is the goal. Uh, the goal is not to get more fans in the stadium. The goal is to get the stadium to generate more revenue per fan per day of operation. And that's one of the main reasons why stadiums went from costing, say, $400 million in the 1990s to a billion dollars today. So those costs are not about bringing more people in to watch sporting events. They're about raising more revenue for the team owners. Why is this the case? Well, in the NFL in particular, stadia are one of the few revenue sources that aren't shared uh, via revenue sharing with the rest of the league. Uh, it's expected, it's the average increase in value of a sports franchise that has a new stadium is 100%. So the Falcons are currently uh, one of the lower uh, evaluated uh, franchises in the NFL. 
uh, with the construction of a new stadium, they would immediately move much higher up the tier uh, of value and likewise of profitability. Uh, because those profits, it's not just the ticket sales, it's the concessions, it's the parking, it's all of those things because even though there are public funds that go towards the stadium construction, in general the rental agreements given to team owners are quite generous. Uh, in fact, often to the point of being free. So, those are the kinds of broad economic conditions that compel uh, team owners to want to have new stadiums. It's not about producing necessarily a better experience for the fans. It's about revenue. That's fine. We live in a society where revenue generation is considered an appropriate and valuable way to spend one's day. But we should be clear on what that means for the public. Um, the other is that jobs numbers uh, around stadia construction routinely uh, only account for the jobs associated with the new stadium and do not take into account the jobs lost with the end of an old stadium. So when we talk about jobs numbers, we're almost always hearing numbers that describe the value added without taking into account the subtractions that almost always take place in these conditions. Clearly, I've angered somebody. <laughs> <laughs> oh. what, what? <laughs> Powerful forces are at work. Exactly. Should I just hold it? Maybe. Should I console it? <laughs> we can switch you to the handheld if you don't mind. Sure. Okay. okay. That, can you hear me on this? Uh, so, the, the other thing is, uh, so those job numbers, right, we, they have to be parsed. Uh, and they have to be understood uh, somewhat skeptically. Uh, uh, the transition, often the argument is that people who worked at the old stadium will find jobs at the new stadium. In fact, recent studies have shown that uh, this is not often the case, that there's often a high rate of turnover. The other is, in terms of increases in tax revenue, is we very rarely see these studies taking into account substitution effects, which is that dollars that are being spent at the new stadium are dollars that aren't being spent at other local businesses. So they aren't new revenue. They're swapping for revenue that would have been generated elsewhere. This is problematic for one primary reason, which is that dollars spent at Stadia, especially NFL stadiums in the United States, are dollars that are not likely to be re-spent in the local community. Whereas if you go to a restaurant and you buy a meal there, the revenue that you generate, that restaurant owner likely will re-spend those dollars buying things for their restaurant in the local community. So the overall impact, economic impact of a stadium uh, is often felt outside of the locale in which it's built in, in very interesting ways. Again, this is from someone who, when, when I travel, you can talk to my wife about it, she knows, I will say we have to go to this stadium, we have to go to this stadium. Have to, <laughs> why do we have to see these? They're all the same. They're just you know, a bunch of seats in the field. And they say, no, 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 these are, very, these are very important places. And they are, because the cultural ritual associated with sport is incredibly powerful. And it is the case that in an urban context in the late 20th century and 21st century, stadia are cathedrals. They are cathedrals where important rituals take place, urban identity is formed, these are valuable things. The question is, what is the appropriate way to finance them? Uh, the other thing is that big sports are not actually very good big employers. NFL teams don't actually employ that many people. And in fact, uh, the average NFL team, according to a study in the mid-90s, employed on average 120 full-time people year-round. That's not that many. There are some economists that have proposed, uh, one in particular, that the economic impact of an NFL team is actually roughly equivalent of that to a large supermarket. <laughs> if I said I need 300 million for a large supermarket, you would say, flowers, get out of here. <laughs> not gonna happen. I'd say, it's the best supermarket ever. <laughs> Atlanta will have a reputation as the place with the greatest supermarket. And in fact, Birmingham in the UK, Birmingham has a Selfridges, which is this, supermarket, but it's designed this outrageous architecture. In fact, people like me do go to Birmingham to go to that supermarket. So, in, you know, it can happen. Um, the last uh, couple of things is that we talk about an iconic structure uh, and the need for a city to have an iconic structure. I would argue uh, that too many of our public study, uh, NFL study, are rarely iconic in form. We don't usually think of them in our minds as a beautiful elevation or a building that we see uh, that looks great. 
The other is a building can't become truly iconic if it only lasts 25 to 30 years. So if you tear down a building after 25 years, its opportunity to become iconic is severely constrained. So we should think about that. In Europe, you have stadia that have been renovated and enlarged over the course of 60, 70, 80 years. And those are, in fact, icons in the urban fabric. Uh, finally, the thinking on these projects is often remarkably conventional. We should think of this not as a stadium project, but rather a billion dollar infrastructure project in a city that has very few large scale infrastructure investments of that kind. It's not should we or shouldn't we, but rather if we're going to do it, what should we ask for besides just a field and stands that are active eight days out of the year for an NFL team, and then possibly uh, maybe at best 60 or 70 more days out of the year with other projects. In South Africa, construction of new study has been linked with the creation of public health clinics to assist in fighting HIV AIDS. Uh, in England, there is a project, the UK requires a 1% for arts on certain large scale projects that require public funding. I would suggest in line with Reverend Motley's comments that we should ask ourselves, what does $300 million in public expenditure get? Uh, 1% of revenue generation per annum that is uh, re-spent re re in the adjacent communities? Would 1% be appropriate? 3%. More. All of the private investors that will go to Arthur Blank as he leverages capital for that $670 million will be expecting something in return for that investment. Public dollars shouldn't do otherwise. What the nature of that return might be is open for discussion. So I think that's one area. The other is programmatically. We're going to build something really, really big. It can accommodate lots of other things. What might it accommodate? Educational center? Child care? Public health? The range is there. The range is open. You don't find someone becoming the CEO of Home Depot and becoming a billionaire by being a conventional thinker. The people involved in these projects have the capacity to be quite innovative. The Georgia World Congress Center has produced extensive master planning documents that outline a range of options. We need to have the dialogue about this project as it goes forward, which I think it will embrace those options and see what can this be. It's going to happen, but what do we want it to be? What can we aspire to have it to be? If we want it to be actually something that makes Atlanta distinctive uh, and different, uh, then in fact I think that's precisely the kind of thinking that would achieve that, which would be a mutual benefit, I suspect, for both the team and the ownership and for the city. There needs to be some kind of way to find a capacity for both sides to gain, rather than if it's simply a stadium that operates as most do, most of the gains will accrue to the ownership and very few of the gains will accrue to the city. The economics on, on stadia impact economically, public funding of them, are almost uniform among scholarly studies. They do not do a good job of generating revenue or jobs. You could spend that money much more effectively if you want, if that was your goal. The, the studies are, are, are quite clear. So instead, since we know the tangible effects are not as, as great as, as proponents claim, if we're going to look for intangible ones, then we need to find intangible ones that likewise benefit the surrounding community. I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Flowers. Uh, oh, wow, the, the mic sounds great now. <laughs> so uh, next, uh, uh, thank you again to all four panelists. Uh, now we'll get into the, uh, another interactive portion. Uh, so we'll have another text question for you. And the question is, uh, what do you consider the most important impact that a new stadium might have on the city of Atlanta? Again, the code that you're texting to is 22333. And the response possibilities are, Further revitalization of downtown Atlanta, text 545552. Impacts on surrounding residential communities, 546020. Job creation, 546021. Increased potential to host the Super Bowl or large events, 547247. Or other, 547248. We'll give it a couple seconds to...
बन गया था It's a different code. Than All right. Well, imagine what you think the answer might be. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we can get back to it later. <laughs> Uh, so next, I think uh, something that I, I know uh, a lot of us are looking forward to is the panel discussion. So now, uh, if we can do this in an orderly fashion, I will momentarily move down right here in the aisle. And if you have any questions for the panel, please just line up uh, right down here and I will give you the mic to ask a question. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Deborah Scott. I'm the executive director of an organization called Georgia Stand Up, and you're right on. Um, part of what you dealt with today is really called community benefits. And so I guess my question to the panelists is, and all for all of you, is what community benefits should actually be derived from this project, and how do you propose the community to receive those? Because you're both elected officials and um, uh, clergy as well, uh, as well as this fine institution. And so how can you help the community actually achieve community benefits? And when you talk about community health care clinics and child care and revenue going back to the community, how could that actually be done here in Atlanta? Thank you. I think that's a a great question. I think um, I think a great model to use or start with um, is actually some of the work that you're doing around Fort McPherson and getting the community involved and understanding actually what it is that the community wants and needs and then helping facilitate with them how to go about getting it and making it happen. And so I think they're going, you know, there needs to be some technical <clears throat> support for the community to come together, figure out um, you know exactly what it is that they're, they're they want that they need how they're going to be impacted from the new stadium uh, and then to, to go collectively uh, like the communities around Fort McPherson have done uh, and try to get some some inked agreements with the World Congress Center Authority and the Falcons uh, and so I think I think that's the first step is just getting the community together getting the technical support together to actually um, get their concerns and everything laid out in a way that they can actually get something done without just a bunch of meetings and people shouting. As you know, um, stadium construction does not enjoy a good history as it relates to helping the surrounding communities. Um, and that has been sort of an excuse from some quarters um, to not place as much emphasis on it or to oppose the stadium coming altogether. Uh, but I think as my good friend Dr. Flowers has mentioned, the creativity of uh, many of the folk um, who are in, involved in, in, in the stadium effort along with your creativity from Georgia stand up as it relates to uh, putting together that whole package of community benefits. I think if those two parties come together with with those kinds of structures and those kinds of models that ways can be found, creative ways can be found to address the needs of the community. And I think that's very key, looking at the needs. We are a resource poor neighborhood and community. And, you know, we were talking about public and private options as it related to the, uh, to Obamacare on the, on the national level. Well, we need some private and public options 
to offer the boys and girls in challenged communities like English Avenue to address their educational needs, their health care needs, um, um, their dental needs, on and on and on. There are incredible needs, role models, um, sister and brother organizations. There's a beautiful program that uh, Sally Yates, who's the U.S. Attorney, um, put together with service providers for ex-offenders and they utilized the Linger Street Church facility and what they did was they uh, they asked uh, the ex-offenders to, to come to Linger Street and they pulled together service providers such as job trainers, um, Salvation Army, Boys and Girls Clubs, health care folks, um, drug treatment folks, alcoholic treatment folks, across the board. And they lined those tables up in that church and they asked those ex-offenders to go to the tables of which they had the greatest needs. Something on that order as it relates to addressing the pressing needs of uh, our brothers and sisters in the English Avenue community. Dr. King said, if we don't learn to live together as brothers and sisters in this country, in our society, we will perish as fools. And I believe that. We have to learn how to make resources available to all of God's children. Any other thoughts from the panel? Uh, I would just add that we have, uh, in, have in the past at the, at the School of Architecture done studios on remediation of things like the expansive parking around Turner Field about ways to uh, retrofit that to turn it into something actually much more pleasant and livable. I think that the School of Public Policy uh, is well positioned to, to do a studio on, a, on questions like these. I think there's an incredible amount of creativity uh, and thinking available to the GWCC and the proponents of the stadium project should they be looking for uh, right next door uh, to where this site will eventually take place and I would encourage them to consider doing so. I think it's been covered. Yeah. Sure. We have another question. Thanks. My name is Ryan Splitlog. I'm the assistant director at Common Cause Georgia and I have a question that's tangentially related um, to the community, local community benefit. It's mostly to do with, I mean, I noticed none of you are representing the Georgia World Congress Center Authority or the Atlanta Falcons here tonight. So these types of discussions are really useful to generate community involvement, but they aren't really, they don't really have a lot of teeth if no one is here to listen. So I was wondering what each of you thought, um, I mean, specifically Representative Dudgeon and Representative Taylor, if that, if you think that the Falcons or the World Congress Center should take more of an active role in engaging uh, panels like this and and community engagement. Thanks. I'll, I'll start on that. Um, I have personally met with the World Congress Center Authority to sort of convey my message and the message of some of my colleagues in the General Assembly who agree with me. And, and the one thing I would think is true is that, you know, they could have hammered out a deal with this a long time ago. And I think one reason that they've taken so long is because they are trying to build more community support. Because they right off the bat, they didn't get a resounding, you know, thumbs up from enough of the people. There's enough concerns. and enough uh, issues out there with the public that I think they are trying to look for this and and I think they're 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 they may not be here but I think there's a there's a strong awareness from my talking to those folks they know that the people out there have concerns about this being a wise investment and want to make sure it's done the right way and, and I'll comment a little bit on the previous question you know I never really thought about the idea of tying some of the the, the revenue generation back to some things in the community interesting I mean that's a that's a you could probably perhaps to give the Atlanta City Council as part of the authority on the tax in order as part of the agreement to, to funnel some money back that way if we end up doing this. I, I, I don't have a principled objection to that idea. Um, my, um, I've been involved with this since 2010, actually. <clears throat> in addition to House Bill 903, I sponsored the bill that increases the, or extends it for the city of Atlanta, not just Fulton County. Uh, the hotel motel tax and the conversations I've had with the World Congress Center Authority uh, folks with the Arthur Blank folks with the Atlanta Falcons folks about what are you going to do for the community there was a 
For example, there was a pot of money available for small businesses that were displaced or impacted by the stadium a few years ago. I had some um, businesses, small businesses in my district in English Avenue and Vine City who approached me about if that pot of money will be available, for example, if a new stadium is built. Uh, the feedback I got from the World Congress Center and the Falcons is once we figure out how we're going to pay for this stadium, uh, we'll definitely have an aggressive conversation on community benefits and community investment. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a process. The commissioner for the NFL, I think, was in Atlanta today, meeting with the mayor and the governor. Uh, I think there's going, probably going to be an announcement very soon about what the stadium is going to look like, how we're going to pay for it, and then how we're going to uh, impact and invest in the community. So I think that's, it has to come, I think, if we talk about a balanced investment. Uh, and so I think it's coming. Um, Timing-wise, I think this is the appropriate time now for the community to get together under maybe the technical support of a Georgia stand-up to come up with here's how we're going to be impacted and here's what we want so that when the time comes to come to the table, we come to the table with a clear plan and objectives on what we want rather than trying to figure out at the last minute what we want and then at the end of the negotiations we figure out we should have asked for something completely different if we had just had the time and planning uh, to get together. So I would not under or discount the, the importance of the technical support in bringing the community together because you've got diverse community voices, English Avenue and Vine City in particular, <laughs> are very, the communities that are very similar, but they've got very di diverse, distinct voices within those communities that need and want distinct and diverse things. Uh, and so getting those people together at the table and coming up with something that they can all, they all can agree on to go to the World Congress Center and the Falcons is gonna be like getting cats to mm -hmm. walk in a straight line, but it's something that has to be done. And I think we've gotta start now so that when the conversation is ready, we're ready to be at the table. There any other questions? So, yeah. My name is Jim Schneider. Uh, I'm the uh, land use and zoning chair for the Atlanta Planning Advisory Board. I live in Castleberry Hill, and you haven't mentioned if, de depending on what location, is the Mar Marietta Street Artery Association. Obviously, would be impacted by the northern location. But one of the things that bothered me in the past a great deal is that the city has shown no spine in talking about land use off of the Georgia World Congress Center campus. Because when you start spilling out, you don't, you know, you're allowing people to use land for parking, surface parking, and that's really a negative. And somewhere, I mean, I obviously I know the Georgia stand up, been doing that for a long time. But the Atlanta Planning Advisory Board is all 25 MPUs, covers the entire city. And lately, I think in the last two years, the near west side has been talking, the NPUs have been talking to each other. That's the vehicle that we need to have. We need to have a commitment from the city of Atlanta that the land use issues will not be just paved over because the Congress Center wants to, but because they don't own that land. This is private property. And the other thing that we've sort of talked on, but we haven't gotten to the point, is where is the way to build full-time types of jobs around the Congress Center? Now, we understand that the multimodal is talking about some of that, and that's going to abut this location. It abuts the, the uh, Georgia Dome now. And we've got to find a way, and there are other models in other cities where there is more activity around the stadia that uh, we don't have here. Turner Field is a prime example of nothing going on around it other than parking. You get a few vendors, but they're not generally there if the, if the Braves aren't there. So we've got to find a model for that. And it's not just, you know, Vine City, English Avenue. I mean, God forbid that's such a declining population. And the city has such a bad history of doing economic community development. They don't know how to do it. They, all they want to do is throw money and they never have any money. You've got to get the communities to build on themselves. And I, I challenge the churches, because frankly, you know, we're talking about losing one more Mount Vernon Baptist may in fact go, and then you're left with Friendship Baptist uh, basically being in, in the area. And it's in, inundated with tailgating, parking, and certainly my neighborhood, and we have problems with the city really wanting to enforce 
keep the you know by, uh, enforce the noise ordinance, parking, trash, all those things, and that Im impacts you know Vine City and English Avenue as well. So we've got these issues that are all around it. We need to make certain that that happens. And I charge you, where do we get that incentive to make that happen on the land use and the uh, code enforcement? Well, it's four, four churches actually where that uh, there where you mentioned both uh, um, uh, Mount Vernon, Friendship, Central United Methodist, and East and West Mitchell. And Rising Star is gone. Absolutely, it was enlightening. You're absolutely correct. The uh, ratio currently uh, is 80-20 for how people get to the average Falcons game: 80% by car, 20%. Uh, by other means, uh, the estimates for what the uh, the number of surface parking spots they would need within a 20-minute walk from the new stadium is something in the range of 23,000. Uh, really, the, what needs to happen is there needs to be a system for getting people to a stadium that's located in town that isn't vehicle-based, uh, and that's a long-term proposition. But if you're investing a billion dollars, then you're talking about long-term investments, and I would say some kind of idea of how you would more robustly link up this stadium with more meaningful public transportation systems and networks and locate the parking elsewhere and then use that revenue that's generated to mean to, to allow vacant lots to be developed into something else so that people aren't illegally allowing people to park on there for 12 bucks per car and then leaving or churches finding that parishioners can't get in on Sunday. You know, those yeah. are the kinds of issues that have to be addressed and it's, it's not impossible. It can be done. It just needs to be foregrounded. And, and let me add that as it relates to those churches, you're talking about churches with constituencies that greatly, as it relates to population, go way beyond the populations of the communities themselves. Because uh, we have 48 churches, 23 churches in English Avenue, and 48 in all in English Avenue and Vine City. And so you're talking let's say Antioch alone, you're talking 10,000, they boast of 10,000 plus members, and those members are some of the movers and shakers of this city. As it relates to Antioch, of course, in Lindy Street, we, we move and shake too. <laughs> uh, and uh, up at least uh, close to 1,000 members, at least on roll. And uh, other churches that most of our 90% of our constituents come from the metro area in some of the finest communities and uh, some of the uh, greatest professional folk in this in the city and so they descend on these communities they have invested their tithes and offerings their resources their gifts their talents in their churches they descend on it every Sunday and throughout the week Bible study other ministries so uh, we're talking capacity of 12,000 uh, plus as it relates to seating capacity of all of those churches at any given one sitting um, and beyond. So keep that in mind when you think of our communities, that they make up folk who make up our congregations from all over the city. And that number would be something like what, Tracy, of all the constituents together. My God, I don't know, maybe 15 goes to 20,000 folk. So. so we have time for two more quick questions. Uh, so if, uh, um, yeah. One and two. Hi, I'm Lamar Dixon. Um, I'm now in group. I, uh, Actually, by trade, I'm a marketer, law firm, but I tutor at Bethune, which is directly across the street from the dome. Um, but I guess my first question is for uh, Representative Taylor. Um, in one of the slides, you explained, uh, I guess, the cities that had lost teams and how they paid for them, how the new stadiums were paid for uh, by public funds. Um, three of those cities had, at the time, I guess, outdated the, um, the stadium of the Oilers replaced the Astrodome, the Ravens replaced the Memorial Stadium, and uh, Cleveland replaced Municipal Stadium. I'm actually from Baltimore, so I'm, you know, intimately, you know, uh, acquainted with the situation. 
can you explain what the agency is to replace a 20-year-old stadium and the correlation, I guess, between the figures that you cited in your PowerPoint and how that relates to replacing the dome, which is not as nearly as old a stadium as those are? Yeah, um, I think it's a great question. Um, one, the dome, I'll make a couple of points. Um, by the time we pay off the debt on the dome, it'll be 25 years old. Um, the World Congress Center is actually scheduled to pay off the debt three years early. Uh, and we've currently got, even though it looks great and it's, you know, I, I go to the stadium, the dome as often as I can, uh, it's the fourth oldest facility in the league. Uh, and so you talk about, oh, it's only 25 years old, oh, it looks good and we're still attracting the Final Four for next year. Uh, but the question is, do you replace it when it's 30 years old? Do you replace it when it's 35 years old, when it's the oldest, when it's the third oldest uh, in the league? It's the fourth oldest in the league. By the time we pay off the debt, it'll be 25 uh, years old. And like an old car, you're going to keep putting more money into it than it's worth when you may as well go ahead and get a new one. Uh, and so when you, when you talk about the urgency of, <laughs> Deborah didn't like my analogy with the old car, but when you talk about the urgency, I'm looking at it from a long-term perspective. It's the fourth oldest dome in the facility, and the NFL is a very competitive, competitive business. It is a business, and it's designed to make money. There's a reason that, they're act, that the city of LA is putting up big money to attract an NFL team. It's a, it is a business. Um, but it's also a 25-year-old facility. Uh, and at the end of the day, do you replace it when the seats cave in, when the roof caves in, when the turf is coming up? I mean, at some point, you know, you decide that you're going to make the investment or not, uh, and you decide what the level of the public investment will be. I don't think it should be an open-ended public investment. Uh, I probably wouldn't go beyond what we've done now in terms of the hotel motel tax, uh, and I certainly wouldn't increase taxes uh, to pay for it, but I think extending the hotel motel tax that's currently not really hitting the pockets of people who live in Atlanta, uh, it's a tax that's dedicated for this reason, so you can't, if you don't use it, say, oh, well, let's spend it on education or transportation or this or that. It's a, it's a dedicated um, funding source. It can only be used uh, for those things, to fund the Convention and Visitors Bureau, to fund the debt service on a dome facility. So um, you can't really shift that money around to other pots. It's kind of like, you know, they talk about the Social Security lockbox. You pay your taxes into Social Security, it can only be spent on that one thing. And that's how the motel, hotel motel tax is for the dome. And so it's a tax that's borne by the people who visit our city. Uh, and I want Atlanta to stay competitive. And so for me, the urgency is that it's the fourth oldest in the league. And by the time we pay it off, it'll be 25 years old. I see your representative Dudgeon shaking his head. I'll give him a couple seconds to uh, give his take. Me and, me and Representative Taylor have fun debating things in the Education Committee down We the do. Um, and I like him because he's a very smart guy and, and makes great arguments. I'll point out, though, the dome was not built to last 25 years, built to last a lot longer than that. I think by the common sense, we kind of all know the dome's got a good 10, 15 years left in it before there's any major problems. Dr. Flowers hit on it. They're just trying. Fundamentally, the NFL is trying to increase the revenue per dollar, which to me is not a big enough reason for all this public investment. All right, we have time for one last quick question, and you have the honor, sir. Uh, Jamil El Shayer from the ITC, the Interdenominational Theological Center. The um, couple of things. It was mentioned about the salon, doing salons to have discussions around this. Mm -hmm. And it was also mentioned that Atlanta has a bad history of, of redevelopment. One of the things that I've observed is there's a lot of talk and dialogue that has happened over the years, urban renewal and the Olympics going on. So my question is, how do we structure this so that, it's a, that there's not just dialogue, but there's also teeth and a, a, a structure that makes sure that community interests and some of the things that you talked about are actually embedded in the, in the partnership, because a partnership has to be framed in a way that, that the partners honor their agreements. And this goes to uh, what Reverend Dudgeon says, that people, governments have a bad reputation for not living up to their agreements. Mm -hmm. Then the other point is that in that legislation, it also talks about renovation, 
that these funds can be used for renovations. The Georgia Dome has the potential for being iconic if we make that decision. But that's also part of this dialogue. So how do we put this put this in and are the legislatures legislators open to helping with the churches actually put the structure in place and perhaps as you said yeah. either churches in partnership with Georgia Georgia Tech because I know you have such partnerships and even with the ITC having these dialogues and framing this way uh, two minutes the um, <clears throat> dome can be put in the same category as the lottery I'm not a supporter of the lottery, but I did support the Hope Scholarship when it was really a scholarship and not turned into what it is now. But <clears throat> unless something is benefiting people, unless there is a direct, that's a good term, benefit, is having a direct benefit to um, uh, enhance the lives of people, which the dome in and of itself won't, can't do. But it, that can be creative ways, just as the lottery was used and much of the revenue was used to send poorer kids to college. Creative ways can be used for the, these windfall profits from these stadiums to be siphoned, funneled, redirected back into the communities to meet some human needs, to meet the needs of the citizens and those particularly of the least of these. And I hope those who are going out to be planners will have that moral component in you and not just be concerned for profits. I, I got a real practical thing to point out in that the legislation has given this authority to the Atlanta City Council. City Council has the authority to authorize use of this funds and so really a dialogue with your city councilman would be very good because as Rashad knows those guys are going to be the ones dotting the I's and crossing the T's on exactly how this is going to interact with the city of Atlanta. So the mayor, city councilman, I would suggest that y'all really, for the community to really engage, they're the ones holding the cards on the details. Am I right, Representative Taylor? You're right. I mean, we talked about zoning yeah. and land use, all that. I mean, that's more of a city and county function. In terms of the state legislature, the most that we'll do in the future, I think, is to increase the work Congress and its bonding authority. And then they'll come back to us probably when they're ready to do the construction to um, relax the sales taxes on the construction materials used to actually build the new dome. So that'll probably be $30 million in sales tax revenue that the state won't get um, um, for the It'll construction right. for the construction material. So, um, so yeah, most of the conversations that are happening moving forward will be happening with the city and the and the I mean, that's why the mayor and the governor and the commissioner were meeting today. That's that is where. Uh, it rests. It, we essentially just extended the ability to have the hotel motel tax used to either uh, renovate the dome or build a new facility. Uh, Dr. Flowers, would you like 20 seconds or do you, if you have any thoughts? I'm neither an elected official nor a man of the cloth, so I have by <laughs> definition the least influence on that question. <laughs> I, I think we'll end the Q&A like on, on that note. Uh, so real quickly, we'll give it one last try, and then we'll, we will be done for the night uh, w after a couple announcements. Uh, so again, the, the code is 22333. Uh, same question as the first question. What is your opinion on Atlanta building a new football stadium? Uh, and it's the same responses, and I can read them to you. I do not support building a new stadium, 555270. I support building it and providing public funding, 5601. Oh, here, it's working, great. All right. I think you guys have it all figured out, so I'll just let you vote. We'll give it a few more seconds. Change some lines. Okay. Okay, I think it's pretty much stopped. Oh. So we have a slight change. Went from 7%? Uh, <laughs> That's pretty so undecided went from 19%. Oh, You've done good. You, you won some votes. All right, I picked up a few <laughs> votes here today. <laughs> Rashad done good. He's worked, he's worked. So just for reference, uh, the change in numbers was slight, but a little bit of an influence after tonight. Uh, the original uh, numbers were 35, 7, 39, 19. So slightly less support uh, after the panel discussion, but more or less similar. Um, but yeah. interesting to note the slight change. 
And with that said, I will now hand the microphone over to Rochelle. Okay, I'll be very respectful of your time. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for, to our panelists. We have a small gift for you. Um, just some Georgia Tech paraphernalia, if you will. Um, thank you all. Have a good evening. And we really do hope that this is just a continuation Thanks. of a discussion that will continue to take place. Thanks. Thank you. Cool.